If you have your Bibles, look with me in Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30 and verse 22 of Exodus chapter 30. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take for yourself quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much of sweet smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels of sweet smelling cane or calamus, some translations say. 500 shekels of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen, which is a container, that's basically five quarts of olive oil. In my Bible that I'm reading from, uh, I get different study Bibles and go through them. And the particular one that I'm reading, it has a heading over these verses called the holy anointing oil. And that is exactly what it is. This is God's recipe for the anointing. And he says that it was to be made of five different ingredients, the precious anointing oil that they used to anoint kings and priests. And for so many other occasions, it had to have five ingredients, specific, a specific recipe was given for the anointing oil. And I want to speak to you for a few moments today on the subject of the five ingredients of an anointed life. Don't you want to live an anointed life? Not just a life, but an anointed life. And the five ingredients are found in this text, and they must be present in your life to produce an anointed life. The recipe for the anointing. And he said, the first thing that you are to put in the anointing oil is a spice called myrrh. Myrrh is a fragrance that comes from the trunk of a comophora tree in Arabia. It's produced in the form of tears. Alcohol is added to remove any impurities. And listen carefully. Then it is steamed. And as the steam passes through the gum, it's melted into a flowing oil. And that oil becomes a perfume. Myrrh is a beautiful picture of meekness and submission. And I'll make that clear in just a moment. The number one ingredient for an anointed life is meekness and submission to God's will. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength in harness for service. Meekness is the raging river no longer flowing wide and wild but submitting to the dam so that from it might come hydroelectricity. It's submitting all that you have in obedience to God. And when you do that, the anointing is attracted to your life. Submission and meekness is the wild, untamed, powerful stallion submitting to the bit, the bridle, the saddle, and the tug of the reins. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3 that Moses was the meekest man who ever lived. How did it come to be? How did he become so meek? It was because it took one third of his life to get to that place. Forty years was spent in the wilderness, stripped of the marble columns of Egypt, stripped of the silk and the satin and the prosperous place that he had grown up most of his life. And now he finds himself in a desert. And from the high life that he was living in Egypt to 40 years of tending sheep in the desert. But during those 40 years, see, all of you want to be instantaneous, successful people. But 40 years of waiting and calling on God until rebellion was gone. It just was steamed out of him. Self-will was gone and submission and meekness to God began to happen. Stubbornness was burned out of him. The steam of God's spirit had passed through the gum of a man's very fiber. And now the oil is flowing out of his life and God sends a burning bush and speaks to him and God's watching him and his reaction. And the first thing he does is in meekness, he takes his shoes off 
as a sign of reverence and respect to the presence of God. Then he listens to the voice of God because he knows you'll hear many voices, but that voice is the one I must follow. And God says, I'm going to teach you faith, Moses. I'm going to teach you faith that confronts your greatest fear. Go to Pharaoh and tell him I am sent you. And in submission to God, in great meekness, understanding that my job is just to obey God and let God deal with the consequences. I'm just going in submission and in total meekness, doing what God told me to do. And God in that said to him, Moses, don't ever forget there is a place by me and you can be in that place. You can settle for the multitudes at the foot of the mountain, or you can come halfway up with the 70 elders, or you can come up to a place of nearness to me for there is a place by me. And when you get to that place of meekness, and when you get to that place of total submission, where you say what Mary said to those servants, Whatever he says unto you, do it. When you reach that point, when you can carry out Mary's orders and whatever he tells you to do, you are submitted. You are meek enough to just do it. God says, now you are discovering the first step to an anointed life. And you'll never be able to submit to your husband, to your wife, to elders, to leadership, You'll never be able to submit to them until you submit to God. The first ingredient of an anointed life is meekness, is submission, is saying, God, I will do whatever you want me to do. And it doesn't have to be big. I'll be obedient. When you do that, the anointing is attracted to your life. The second ingredient for an anointed life was something called cinnamon. The cinnamon came from a tree that grew 30 to 40 feet. And the remarkable thing about it was it grew straight up. They say that it grew so straight that it had no curves. And they would take the leaves and the fruit of that upright tree and squeeze them. And out of that would come a fragrant oil. They made candles for the king of Simon that had a beautiful fragrance. The second ingredient of an anointed life is called uprightness or how you stand. When I talk about standing upright, I'm not talking about you acting like you are so self-righteous that you're on spiritual stilts, looking down at all the unspiritual people who don't live as pure and as clean as you do. We don't tower down on people, looking down on people. But there is a truth that when we take an upright stand, when we stand up for what is right, the anointing is attracted to our life. Did you know the Old Testament said that if a man had a crooked back, he was disqualified from being a priest in the temple? It's because it affected the way that he stood and God wanted to make a point. He wanted us to know that our stand, our upright stand matters. It matters to whether or not the anointing is attracted to your life. If he had a crooked back, he couldn't stand straight. And then God said in his qualifications for priesthood, if his back is crooked, he can't stand straight. He doesn't qualify. God is saying to you and I, I want you to stand for truth. Added light brings added blessing and added blessing brings added responsibility. And this is an hour when we need to stand for truth. Stand in his righteousness, not your own. Billy Crabtree said on Christ, the solid rock I stand and every other rock is a shamrock. And that's the truth. I rise today to tell you that if you are standing in your own righteousness, you will not make it. But what is the basis of your stand? I point you to Jesus. I point you to his blood shed on the cross and without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. That is how we stand. Thirdly, we stand on his promises. You need to understand you either have a living faith or a dying faith. Whose report will you believe? 
Stand on the promise of divine healing. You may have gotten a bad report from the doctor. I respect and appreciate the doctors, but they do not have the last word. Stand on the promises of God that by his stripes we are healed. With long life, he'll satisfy us and show us his salvation. You may be fighting all kinds of things that are trying to destroy your children and your family and your home, but stand on the promises of God that say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved and my house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. No weapon formed against us will prosper. And if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand on the promises of God. Then there are times where if you want the anointing, you have to stand against the world, the devil, and the flesh. Martin Luther was asked, do you know the whole world seems to be against you? He said, good, I'm against the whole world. There comes a moment where we have to Get a divine backbone and take a stand for what is right. And it doesn't matter what public opinion says about it. And it doesn't matter what people think. Just do what God tells you to do. And when you are upright in your stand, it draws the anointing. The Bible said in Hebrews 11 that Moses made a choice to say no to Egypt and yes to God. There was a yes and there was a no. I wonder if there's any no's in your life. Are there any, is everything yes, yes, bless me, yes, yes. But do you ever get a no in your life where the Holy Spirit says, no, don't do that, don't go there, don't touch that, don't listen to that, don't look at that. We don't just need yeses in our life. We need a stand, an upright stand that says no to sin, no to the world, no to the flesh, no to the devil. Get out of my house. Get out of my mind. Get out of my heart. You've got to say them both. Say yes and no to God. Because when you say no to the things God tells you to say no to, his favor and his anointing begins to flow in your direction. First John 2, 14, I have written to you young men that the word of God abide in you and you have overcome the evil one. The only way you're going to overcome the evil one is to have the word in you and to take a stand. Beware of charismatic shortcuts to spirituality. There are none. Some things can't be improved on. You can't improve on the wheel. Make one square and just bump all the way home and see how it works. You can't improve on water. Try to take a shower in Pepsi. It doesn't work good. You can't improve on breathing air. Try any other thing for three minutes and see how it works out. And there are certain fundamental things like prayer and worship and reading the word and listening to the word and coming to church and tithing and giving that cannot be improved on. Just do it. And when you do it, God's blessing and his anointing will be attracted to your life. These things cause the anointing to be attracted to your life. Four times in the book of Ephesians, God says, stand, 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 stand. When it looks like your prayers aren't working, when it looks like the fasting isn't working, when it looks like the Bible isn't working, when it feels like the dream is not working, what do you do? You don't quit. You don't get angry. You don't throw in the towel. You stand four times. And when you've done all to stand, stand there for with an upright stand that says, I will not back down from what God has told me to do. The third ingredient of an anointed life is given when he said sweet cane or one translation says calamus. The cane or calamus was a frag, was a fragrant reed, reed that grew in swamps. And the head of that reed was filled with oil. And this is interesting. They knew that it wasn't ready to be used until the head of that reed was bent over and almost touched the ground. It speaks of bending low in humility. If you want 
the ingredient that will attract the anointing of God, you must have humility. John 13 and 5, Jesus had a level of humility that most of us do not understand in this proud society. One by one, the big, smelly peasant fishermen walked in with grindy sand and filth and dirt on their feet. And Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, bent low, bent over, and began to wash their feet. In an ultimate act of humility, the hands that washed those feet were the hands that created the universe. From magnificence to the menial task of foot washing. It was his answer to the question, who shall be greatest in your kingdom? So if you have any ambitions, if you want to be great, bring your basin, bring your towel, and bring your water, and wash feet. Because if you're not willing to bend low in humility and serve people, God says, it's not about your name, it's not about your popularity, it's not about your fame, it's about serving people. Nothing or no one should be, be beneath you serving them. Blessed are the saints of the second fiddle. People who do the job and they get no credit. The first seat of, of an instrumental section is the one who gets the solo. When I was in school, uh, I was the first seat uh, saxophone player and I would get the solo. But there was a second, it was called this, the second seat saxophone player, the third seat. And we would compete every, uh, every uh, semester for who got first seat. And the point is this, that if you had first seat, you'd walk out and take the solo and everybody clapped. But if you were second seat or third seat, you didn't get any attention. You didn't get any praise. But the music would not be what it should be if you didn't have those incredible people in the shadows. And that's how the kingdom of God is. Blessed are the saints of the second fiddle. Psalms 84 said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. I don't have to be the first seat. I don't have to be in the limelight, but I want to do something. I want to wash somebody's feet. Maybe it's in the nursery. Maybe it's in the parking lot. Maybe it's ushering. Maybe it's small grouping. Maybe it's something, but I must do something that serves people. And when you do, the anointing is drawn to that kind of humility. No humility, no anointing. The problem is the more God blesses us, we lose the humility. We lose the willingness to be bent low in humility. But Jesus was as great as you could get, and he modeled humility in washing the disciples' feet. The more humility you have, the more anointing God will put on your life. Walk in humility. And then the fourth ingredient for an anointed life is cassia. This is interesting. They said there were 400 types that grew in, in tropical climates. And one of the things that it produces is something called Sina. And older people may know that, that, that phrase, but it has and was used for inner cleansing. In other words, when, something, when someone was sick, they would take this particular oil and they would pour it down, castor oil, they would pour it down. I wrote down depth charges. <laughs> it was used for inner cleansing. In other words, if you want the anointing, every now and then you need an inner cleansing. You need everything inside of you to be brought to the cross and be brought to the altar and you need to go back to saying, God, search me and try me and see if there be any wicked thing in me. Lord, I need an inner cleansing. Am I letting things get into my life that are not pleasing and hindering the anointing? Before it's a, a deed, it's a thought. And before it's an action, it's an attitude. So cleanse me, search me, 
Know my thoughts, know my inward thoughts, O God, and let me be cleansed inwardly. And when you're cleansed inwardly, you have to clean up your temple. You have to clean up the areas of your temple, the study of your mind. What are you feeding? What are you putting in your mind? Every now and then we need to just clean it out and fill it up with the word of God again. We listen to all the negative, all the this, that, and the other, the noise, and we need to clean out the study of our mind. You need to clean out the dining room of your appetites. You need to clean up the workshop of your talents. You need to clean up the playroom of your pleasures and pastimes and entertainments. Malachi said he will sit as a refiner of silver, He'll keep turning the heat up until the scum comes up and he'll scrape it off until pure silver is nothing, nothing that is left but pure silver. And then it says this, he'll sit as a refiner's fire and fuller soap, fire on the inside and soap for the outside. He says, there are times when I want you to come to church And I want you to get cleaned out and cleaned up. I want you to come in one way with your study of your mind and your appetites and all these things that have gotten a grip on your life. I want you to be completely cleaned out. And when you do, when you submit to the word of God and come with a plea of God, forgive me. God, cleanse me. God, I'm straying so far from the cross. I haven't really, really, really been in your presence in a long time. So Lord, cleanse me. When you cry like that, when you have nothing but a plea that says, I'm not trying to defend what I've said or what I've done and what I've got on the inside, but I am asking you to cleanse me. He'll never turn that kind of person away. And he who began a good work in you will complete it. Clap your hands on that verse. That's a good one. Inner cleansing attracts the anointing. Inner cleansing attracts the anointing. And then one more. He said, you are to take a container, five quarts, The biggest component of the anointing is something called olive oil. And olive oil represents and speaks of the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Olive oil was used to cook food in ancient days. It fed them. The Holy Spirit feeds us. They would use it to bring rest and comfort. They would put it on them after a long journey. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter and he anoints our head with oil. The good Samaritan used the olive oil and poured it with wine into the wounds of the man who had been robbed and it healed his wounds and his hurts. The anointing oil of the Holy Spirit can heal our bodies, our minds, our relationships, our broken hearts. It was used to anoint kings and priests and prophets. And if you haven't heard anything else, here's what I hear the Lord saying in Psalms 92. David said, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. There's nothing worse than stale oil. There's nothing worse than old oil. It attracts flies according to the scripture. And when they get in the oil and Satan is Beelzebub, the Lord of the flies. So when we're living off yesterday's oil, fighting today's battles with yesterday's touches and oils and anointings, it attracts flies. It attracts the attack of the enemy. And there's a stench to yesterday's oil. That's why David said, I'm crying out and I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Fighting today's battles and depending on yesterday's oil is a futile thing and it's a, it's a humiliating, defeating thing that happens. Yesterday's oil is miserable as a substitute for fresh oil today. The five ingredients of an anointed life, meekness, uprightness, humility, 
inner cleansing and a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I wrote this last night. I am a candidate for a fresh anointing. Every day we need a fresh anointing. There's nothing that can take the place of a fresh move of God in your life. Money can't. The house, the car, everything that you think is so important, and they are. And it's sometimes we just get so obsessed with these material things that we forget what really makes us happy. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Is anybody here hungry for the qualities of an anointed life? Would anybody like to bend low in humility? Would anybody like an inner cleansing that everything unlike Jesus would be washed out? Anybody here like to walk in meekness and submission instead of arrogance and pride and stubbornness and rebellion? Anybody here say, I wish I could get filled with the Holy Spirit all over again? lose myself in a river of worship, end up on the floor somewhere, praying in other tongues as the Spirit gives me the utterance. That stuff scares you. Just hang around. We'll get all that fear out of you because that's where the life is. That's where the joy is. Hallelujah. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. I need it. I want it. I'm a candidate for a fresh anointing. If you are, would you lift your hand right where you're sitting at every campus? I know you folks. You'd go to some other church if you just gonna come in here and hear a little thing and leave. And I'm not putting that down. Everybody's got their place and there's great churches that do it totally different from the way we do it. God bless them. But you come to this church not only to hear the word, but to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. So lift your hands high right where you're sitting and say, Lord, my house needs a fresh anointing, my mind, my body. I need an upright stand. I need a divine anointed no. I said yes to you, but I need to say no to some, some temptations and some lies and some compromises. So Lord, it's not just a yes, but it's a no. I need cleansing. I need revival. I need the Holy Spirit to fill me again until I am aware that He is with me. He's here right now. I feel the presence of God in this place. He's there at every campus. Just lift your hands high. Those of you streaming, lift your hands high and just begin to worship God. Just stand to your feet. Why don't we just stand to our feet at every campus? Lift your hands high. I got up this morning and I said, Spirit of the Fall fresh on me, Spirit of the Living God. Fall fresh on me, melt me, mold me, melt. Potter, I'm the clay. Mold me, feel me, use me, feel me. Oh, use me, Spirit. Lift your hands toward heaven. The presence of God is in this place. I want everybody in this room who is a candidate. You don't have to do it. Nobody's going to make you do it. But I feel like doing it a little old school today. 
I want some of our pastors and their wives to come down front. I want them to bring the oil out. We're just going to lay hands on people and anoint people and bless people. If you need a fresh anointing, if you're hungry for an anointing on your family, on your home, maybe there's an attack coming and you just don't know what to do and you don't know where to turn, the anointing has the answer. The anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing lifts heavy burdens. Give me an altar team that goes from one end to the other. I need every altar worker that we've got down here. We're just going to take time today to minister to people. We're going to take time to lay hands on sick people. We're going to take time to anoint people with oil and believe that the fresh power and anointing of God can touch and change lives. Just come on down. If you are a candidate for a fresh anointing and the Lord is speaking to you and you want more out of this service than just, you know, I, I appreciate it, but, but if God is calling you to the cross, calling you to a, to a fresh anointing, this is your service. Get in as close as you can get. And if you really want it, press your way through. There's something about hunger. There's something about desire. There's something about someone who says, I will not let go until you bless me. That anointing awaits you, friend. There are, there are qualities that attract the anointing in our life. And some of you need a divine no. Some of you need an upright stand. He won't look at you in condemnation. We're not standing on spiritual stilts looking down at you. Come humble yourself. Come humble yourself. Move toward the mercy of God and He'll fill you. He'll cleanse you. He'll anoint you. Oh, melt me, Holy Spirit. Mold me, Holy Spirit. Feel me, Holy Spirit. Oh, you me. You can receive a miracle. You can be healed in your body. Just lift your hands and worship all over this room. At every campus, the pastors are coming. Lift your hands. You can be delivered. You can be cleansed from some inward things some addictions and bondages that have tried to destroy you. It's time for an inner cleansing. Let God empty you out and fill you up. Oh, get sincere. Get desperate. Get earnest before God. Oh, fall fresh on me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You haven't left for a reason. Backsliders are about to be saved. People are about to be freed from shackles and prison house of sin. You're still here for a reason. Everything in you said, get out of here because the devil knew what was coming. But greater is he that is in us than the voice that tried to get you out of this room. And I said all that to say it's time to come home to Jesus. So if you want to be saved and you don't know you're right with God and you want to be, throw your hand up in there. Throw your hand up in there. No, no playing games. Throw it up. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. Everybody pray this prayer out loud with them. If their hand is raised, lay your hand on their shoulder. Pray this prayer and say, Jesus, cleanse me save me. I'm running home. I'm running back to you. I strayed so far, but I'm coming home. Wash me, cleanse me, forgive me in your blood. I am free. I am forgiven. I am your child. In Jesus name I ask and I receive forgiveness of sin. Therefore, I am saved. I am born again. I am a new creation. Praise the Lord. Give Jesus the biggest praise of the day. We hope you've enjoyed this teaching by Jensen Franklin. And thank you for your continued support of this ministry. Your prayers and financial support make these programs possible. For more information about this message and other ministry resources, visit us online at JensenFranklin.tv.